Hello and welcome back to Classic Books with Postara and Lily. And tonight we're back reading Plato's Republic. We're on book seven. We are on page 234. I should say a very strange one. If this was as you say, can we deny that a warrior should have a knowledge of arithmetic? Certainly he should. If he is to have the smallest understanding of military tactics, or indeed, I should rather say, if he is to be a man at all. I should like to know whether you have the same notion which I have of this study. What is your notion? It appears to me for, to be a study of the kind which we are seeking and which leads naturally to reflection, but never to have been rightly used. Maybe. For the true use of it is simply to draw the soul toward being. Will you explain your meaning, he said. I will try, I said, and I wish you would share the inquiry with me and say yes or no when I attempt to be to distinguish in my own mind what branches of knowledge have this attracting power in order that we may have clearer proof that arithmetic is, as I suspect, one of them. Explain, he said. I mean to say that Objects of sense are of two kinds. Some of them do not invite thought because the sense is an adequate judge of them. While in the case of other objects, sense is so untrustworthy that further inquiry is imperatively demanded. You are clearly referring, he said, to the manner in which the senses are imposed upon distance. And by painting in light and shade. No, I said, that is not at all my meaning. Then what is your meaning? When speaking of uninviting objects, I mean those which do not pass from one sensation to the opposite. Inviting objects are those which do in this latter case the sense coming upon the object, whether at a distance or near, does not reveal any particular attribute more clearly than its opposite. An illustration will make my meaning clearer here. Here are three fingers, a little finger, a second finger, and a middle finger. Very good. You may suppose that they are seen quite close. And here comes the point. What is it? Each of them equally appears a finger, whether seen in the middle or the extremity, whether black or white or thick or thin, makes no difference. The finger is a finger all the same. In these cases, a man is not compelled to ask of thought the question, what is a finger? For the sight never intimates to the mind that a finger is other than a finger. True. And therefore, I said, as we might expect, there is nothing here which invites or excites intelligence. There is not, he said. But is this equally true of the greatness and smallness of the fingers? Can sight adequately perceive them? And is no difference between, made by the circumstance that one of the fingers is in the middle and the other at the extremity? And in like manner does the touch adequately perceive the qualities of thickness or thinness, of softness or hardness, and so are the other senses. Do they give perfect intimations of such matters? Is it not their mode of operation in this wise? Is not their mode of operation in this wise? The sense which is concerned with the quality of hardness is necessary, necessarily concerned also with the quality of softness, and only intimates to the soul that the same thing is felt to be both hard and soft. You are quite right, he said. And must not the soul be perplexed at this intimation, which the sense gives of a hard, which is also soft? What again is the meaning of light and heavy? If that which is light is also heavy, and that which is heavy, light. Hi, Lily. <laughs> yes, he said, the, these intimations which the soul receives are very curious and require to be explained. Yes, I said. And these perplexities, the soul naturally summons to her a calculation and intelligence that she may see whether the, se the several objects announced to her are one or two true. And if they turn out to be two, is not each of them one and different? Certainly. And if each is one and both are two, she will conceive the two as in a state of division. For if they were undivided... They could only be conceived of as one. True. 
Yeah, I certainly did see both great, small and great, but only in a confused manner. They were not distinguished. Yes, whereas the thinking mind, intending to light up the chaos, was compelled to reverse the process and look at a small, a small and great as separate and not confused. Very true. Was this not the beginning of the inquiry? What is great and what is small? Exactly so. And thus arose the distinction of the visible and the intelligible. Most true. This was what I meant when I spoke of impressions which invited the intellect of the reverse. Those which are simultaneous with opposite impressions invite thought. Those which are not simultaneous do not. I understand, he said, and agree with you. And to which class do unity and number being belong? I do not know, he replied. Think a little, and you will see what that... See, you will see that what has proceeded will supply the answer. For a supply, if simple unity could be adequately perceived by the sight or by any other sense, then as we were saying in the case of the finger, there will be nothing to attract toward being. But when there is some contradiction always present, and one is the reverse of one, and involves the conception of plurality, then thought begins to be aroused within us, and the soul perplexed and wanting to arrive at a decision asks, What is absolute unity? This is the way in which the study of the one has the power of drawing, converting the mind to the contemplation of true being. <laughs> She's a cute cat. And surely, he said, this occurs notably in the case of one, for we see the same thing to be both one and infinite in multitude. Yes, I said, and this is being true of one must be equally true of, of all number. Certainly, and all arithmetic and calculations have to do with number. Yes. And they appear to lead the mind toward truth. That's, that's truth. I, I believe the, the universe is made up of numbers and mathematics so that's where you're going to get your answers to the universe if you're able to figure all that of course i don't know if that's ever going to happen yes and they appear to lead the mind toward truth yes in a very remarkable manner then this is knowledge of the kind for which we are seeking having a double use military and philosophical for the man of war must learn the art of number or he will not know how to array his troops and the philosopher also must learn it because he has to rise out of the sea of change and lay hold of true being or else he will never become a true reckoner. Reckoner. Something like that. <laughs> that is true. And our guardian is both warrior and philosopher. Certainly. Then this is a kind of knowledge which legislation may fitly prescribe and we must endeavor to persuade those who are to be the principal men of our state to go and learn arithmetic not as amateurs, but they must carry on the study until they see the nature of numbers with the mind only, nor again, like merchants or retail traders, with a view to buying or selling, but for the sake of their military use and of the solar cell, and because this will be their military use and the solar cell. Oh, wait, hold on, excuse me. And... But for the sake of their military use of the solar cell, and because this will be the easiest way for her to pass from becoming to truth and being. That is excellent, he said. Yes, I said. And now having spoken of it, I must add how charming the science is, and how many ways it conduces to our desired, and it persuade in the spirit of a philosopher and not of a shopkeeper. How do you mean? I mean, as I was saying, that arithmetic is a very great and elevating effect, compelling the soul to reason about abstract number and rebelling against the introduction of visible or tangible objects into the argument. You know how steadily the masters of the art repel and ridicule anyone who attempts to divide of absolute unity when he is calculating. And if you divide, they multiply, taking care of that one should, shall continue one and not become lost in fractions. That is very true. Now suppose a person were to say to them, Oh, my friends, what are these wonderful numbers about which you are reasoning, in which, as you say, there is a unity such as you demand? 
and each unit is equal in variable and visible, what should they answer? I don't know if this is what he's saying, but this is my thought that <clears throat> through numbers and the universe that you can find God. That's what makes up the universe is numbers. So you can find God and God is the universe. Very, very complicated subject, but that's the gist of that right there. They would answer, as I should conceive, that they were speaking of those numbers which can only be realized in thought. Then you see that this knowledge may be truly called necessary, necessitating, as it clearly does the truth, the use of the pure intelligence and the attainment of tr pure truth. Yes, that is a marked characteristic of it. And have you further observed that those who have a natural talent for calculation are generally quick at every other kind of knowledge? And even the dull, if they have had an arithmetical training, although they may derive no other advantage from it, always become much quicker than they would otherwise have been. Very true, he said. And indeed, you will not find many studies more difficult nor will you find them easily. You will not, and for all these reasons, arithmetic is a kind of knowledge in which the best natures should be trained and which must not be given up. I agree. Let this then be made one of our subjects of education, and next shall we inquire whether the kindred science also concerns us. You mean geometry. <laughs> exactly so. Clearly, he said, we are concerned with the part of geometry which relates to war. For in pitching a camp or taking up a position or closing or extending the lines of an army or any other military maneuver, whether in actual battle or on a march, it will make all the difference whether a general is or is not a geometrician. Yes, I said, but for the purpose, a very little of either geometry or calculation will be enough. The question relates to the greater and more advanced part of geometry, whether that tends in any degree to make more easy the vision of the idea of good, and thither, as I was saying, all things tend, which compel the soul to turn her gaze toward that place, where is the full perfection of being which she ought by all means to behold. True, he said, then if geometry compels us to view being, concerns us if, becoming only it does not concern us. Yes, that is what we assert. Yet anybody who has the least acquaintance with geometry will not deny that such a conception of the science or is in flat contradiction to the ordinary language language of geometricians. How so? They have in view practice only and are always speaking in a narrow a ridiculous manner of squaring and extending and applying and the like. They confuse the necessities of geometry with those of daily life, whereas knowledge is the real object of the whole science. Certainly, he said, then must not a further admission be made. What admission? That the knowledge at which, the geom at which geometry aims is knowledge of the eternal. And that's what I was just talking about. <clears throat> is that numbers of the universe and the eternal is, is God. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, we won't really know that until we die, but uh, that's basic, basic gist of it. And not of aught perishment and transient. Then he replied, may be readily allowed and is true. Then my noble friend, geometry will draw the soul toward truth and create the spirit of philosophy and raise up that which is now unhappily allowed to fall down. And I guess you could say this also goes hand in hand with religion. And my take on that is about religion. Religion itself is a man-made. <laughs> religion itself is man-made. It's, um, <clears throat> it's, I don't know the word, sometimes words elude me, but it's it's restrictive by humans, and it's it's, it's a human institution, for which they are fo following the law of humans and not the law of the eternal God, 
the universe, whatever you want to call it. And that's why you need to, I feel that one should not follow religious institutions. They should follow and seek truth and seek, and that's how you will find God. And it seems like they're saying too that the way to find God is through mathematics, which I, because you're finding eternal truth, the makeup of the universe, which is not the easiest thing, but you do, you keep working and you're working and he, he, she knows and he can feel and they will draw you in and help you find that, guide you to it, guide you further and further. And we'll get off of that for a moment and go back. Okay. Then my noble friend, geometry will draw the soul toward truth and create the spirit of philosophy and raise up that which is now unhappily allowed to fall down. Nothing will be more likely to have such an effect and nothing should be more sternly laid down than the, the inhabitants of your fair city should by all means learn geometry. Moreover, the science has indirect effects, which is not small. Of what kind, he said. There are the military advantages of which you spoke, I said, and in all departments of knowledge, as experience proves, anyone who has studied, studied geometry is indefinitely quicker of apprehension than one who is not. Yes, indeed. Excuse me. He said, there is an infinite difference between them. Then shall we propose this as a second branch of knowledge, which our youth will study. Let us do so, he replied. I suppose we make astronomy the third. What do you say? I am strongly inclined to what he said. The observation of the seasons and of months and years is essential to the general as it is to the farmer or sailor. This astronomy is very important. I am amused, I said, at your fear of the world which makes you guard against the appearance of insisting upon useless studies. And I quite admit the difficulty of believing that in every man there is an eye of the soul which, when by other pursuits lost, dimmed, is by these purified and reillumined, and is more precious far than ten thousand bodily eyes, for by it alone is truth seen. Now there are two classes of persons, one class of those who will agree with you and will take your words as revelation, another class to whom they will be utterly unmeaning and who will naturally deem them to be idle tales, for they see no sort of profit which is to be obtained from them, and therefore you had better decide at once with which of the two you are proposing to argue. You will very likely say with neither, and that your chief aim in carrying on the argument is your own improvement. At the same time, you do not grudge to others any benefit which they may receive. I think that I should prefer to carry on the argument mainly on my own behalf. Then take a step backward, for we have gone wrong in the order of the sciences. What was the mistake, he said. After plain geometry, I said, we proceeded at once to solids and revolution, instead of taking solids in themselves, whereas the second dimension, third which is concerned with cubes and dimensions of death, ought to have followed. And I do believe that, you know, as far as education goes, there are certain subjects that need to be on taught, but I think I, I think you need to learn everything as well, but you do, there are some subjects that do have more precedence. That is true, Socrates, but so little seems to be known as yet about these subjects. Why, yes, I said, for two reasons in the first place. No government patronizes them. This leads to a want of energy in the pursuit of them, and they are difficult. In the second place, students cannot learn them unless they have a director then a director can hardly be found, and even if he could, as matters now stand, the students who are very conceited would not attend to him. That, however, would be otherwise if the whole state became the director of these studies and gave honor to them. Then disciples would want to come, and there would be continuous and earnest search. Discoveries would be made ever since even now, disregarded as they are by the world, and maimed of their fair proportions. And although none of their votaries can tell the use of them, still these studies force their way to their natural charm. 
and very likely, if they had the help of the state, they would someday emerge into light. Yes, he said. Let me look at that little. Cats are creepy. Yes, <laughs> my place. Yes, he said. There is a remarkable charm in them, but I do not clearly understand the change in the order. First, you begin with the geometry of plane surfaces. Yes, I said. And you placed astronomy next, and then you made a step back. <laughs> yes, and I have delayed you by my hurry. The ludicrous state of solid geometry, which in natural order should have followed, made me pass over this branch and go on to astronomy or motion of solids. True, he said. Then assuming that the science now omitted would come into existence and encouraged by the state, let us go to the under astronomy, which will be fourth. A right order, he replied, and now, Socrates, as you rebuked the vulgar manner in which I praised astronomy before, my praise shall be given in your own spirit. For everyone, as I think, must see that astronomy compels the soul to look <laughs> upward and leads us from this world to another. Everyone but myself, I said, to everyone else this may be clear, but not to me. And what then would you say? I should rather say that those who elevate astronomy into philosophy appear to me to make us look downward, not upward. And I'm going to end right there.